Namaste to all of you. Namaste, namaste. Yeah. <coughs> Welcome, friends. In fact, we are all part of this journey. <laughs> uh, why you call journey is uh, Sri Anish is talking about uh, a vision for a new humanity. And it cannot be just a destination. It's a journey. And we need travelers, co-travelers like all of you. Each one of you is a leader. You can impact, influence uh, hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, with that uh, uh, belief, trust, and uh, collaborative efforts, when we can see on a Sunday morning, all of you are here. So we started this journey uh, of organizing programs like uh, integrating Sure. science and spirituality, then we moved on to do a program on compassionate leadership. And today, we're doing it on emotional resilience. So welcome to all of you. So let me take the pleasure of uh, uh, introducing the moderator and the panelists today. So I would request our IT team to put a slide. Uh, the idea is uh, you can go through the slide and I will speak a little. Uh, so I do not want to spend more time uh, on this and give more time to the moderator and the panelist. Yeah, let me start with uh, introducing Sri Anish. Uh, yeah, these are Sri Anish. So I mean, it's very difficult to uh, put his profile on one single face. Uh, see, he started his journey as an HR professional, then he became an entrepreneur. He, he co-founded People Strong, then he moved to uh, Himalayas. So after 10 years of meditation, and now he's uh, started uh, spreading his wisdom, sharing his nuggets with people around the world. And in uh, 2019, he co-founded -found, uh, Sadho Sangha uh, in, the, in Dharmshala in the Himalayas. His vision is to create an awakened leadership in all spheres of life. So, so we are very lucky that today he has uh, agreed to come, set the contest, and also moderate the roundtable. And uh, yeah, incidentally, his uh, book, uh, Let the Mud Settle, is already in the Amazon and will be formally launched very soon. So welcome, Sri Anish. Welcome. Welcome. We'll move on and I will introduce our three uh, great panelist. The first is uh, Sri Ranjan Kumar Mahapatra. No, he needs no introduction. He's a jewel of uh, PSU World. Uh, he's director of HR of Indian Oil, he's chairman of Lanka IOC, chairman of uh, Indian Oil Mauritius Limited. Uh, he's also the president of IPTDO, that is International Federation of Training and Development Organization, and he's trustee. He's the chairman of the Skill Development Institute. He's the member of Board of Governors of Rajiv Gandhi Institute. Several positions he holds. And uh, he has he's, he always comes out with something unique. And uh, he's preparing the leaders in the oil world with his uh, mantras of three years, uh, agility, adaptability, and alignment. And uh, he's instrumental in transforming the face of HR in the entire PSU sector of India. Uh, at uh, Indian Oil, he envisions to align HR initiative to strategic corporate vision. So, welcome, Ranjanji. Welcome, welcome. So, we'll move on. Uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, the roundtable is Dr. Shalini Lal. Uh, she's uh, one of the most qualified people. You know, she is. Uh, she did her MBA from IMA, then uh, uh, worked with great companies. Uh, everybody knows she was in the Deutsche Bank. And uh, she regularly writes in uh, HD Mint, Business World, Forbes. Uh, she has uh, co-founded this great company, uh, uh, Unique B. Uh, it's uh, you know, around the future of world and the education. And uh, she is also an author, uh, The Secret Life of Organizations, a book specially meant for young professionals entering the workplace. So welcome, Shalneti. Welcome. Friends, I am deliberately not reading the slides. The slides are meant to be read by you. So we'll move on and uh, introduce our uh, uh, third panelist, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Sripada. Uh, he combines his vast practitioner experience. He has worked in uh, great companies, 
सेल वाइजाग स्टील एन आई आई टी रिलायंस टेलीकॉम इन्फोकॉम देन यू मूव टू कैप जमनी आई बी एम रेडीज लैब सो नाउ करेंटली इज विथ आई एस बी फोर डिकेट्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस बिसाइड्स टीचिंग नो ही इज ऑल्सो डस एग्जीक्यूटिव कोचिंग एंड ही सिट्स ऑन द बोर्ड ऑफ मेनी कंपनीज and his publication once again is an author his publication leading human capital uh, it came out last year and he writes he is a blogger is a writer is an author is a is a fantastic speaker orator and influencer so welcome dr sri pad chandrasekhar <clears throat> so i try to make it uh, quicker so that we will have more time so as i said uh, this is a journey towards uh, awakened leadership uh it's a journey for creating a great new humanity uh so i will request sri anish uh is joining from himalayas to set the contest and also share his share his uh, nuggets of wisdom then moderate the panel discussion so the after the discussion is over we will have a round of question answers so please feel free to write your questions in the chat box so we'll keep enough room for the q and a session q and a session uh during the panel discussion uh if you have got any thought anything we'll not be able to stop but you please go on writing the chat box if it is a question start with a capital q so that will be help the organizers to pick up your questions uh that's what i request thank you so much so over to sri anish thanks for you know giving us your time thank you all the participants i know sunday morning if you've shown up and uh, have shown the commitment to join the session on sunday morning i i feel i believe that you know the the awakening or or becoming better or self evolution is at the core of your being and that this commitment to come on a sunday morning shows that so thank you and welcome uh, once again everybody you know when we started this initiative as as gp uh, touched about this uh, there's been a thought there's been a there's been a vision that if the whole humanity needs to become more happy more stable more peaceful more joyous uh, we need to start work at the leadership level all the leaders must be much more deeply rooted in them themselves because each leader has a wide span of impacting thousands of lives in 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 some cases even more so we started this series of creating awakened leadership and we started from the from the corporate industry business uh, area and that's how the journey is continuing as gp very nicely put in so to set the context to set the tone you know i have a young son he's about 18 and i see you know these kids doing binge watching these days you know it's a web series and binge watching i'm sure you know we've all witnessed that so i thought let's do today a little of little bit of binge episode through these <laughs> so i have thought about three quick episodes to set the tone the first episode is about you know the team player uh, you will remember this this was 2nd april 2011 india was playing a great match world cup series against sri lanka uh, we had to chase 275 runs uh, in last 28 years before 22011 india had not won any world cup there was an immense pressure on the team uh, only in 2003 we had reached the world cup but we we lost that match so after 28 years we are again in the world cup final and mahender singh dhoni is playing the shot 275 is what we need to target or what we need to achieve to win the match you can think about the immense emotional pressure on this this player mahendra singh dhoni the whole country is kind of hoping from him he must be having a lot of stress a lot of anxiety i'm not sure what he was going through but one can think of a situation when billion people watching you and hoping from you and you you performing you're there at the action the amount of emotional you know upheaval you're going through or pressure that you're going through thankfully mahender singh dhoni won the match we won the match with his huge six shows shows something will come to that so that's the first episode i thought i'll share with you the second episode you know i picked up these episodes to show how emotional resilience 
build us, build our character, build our performance. Second episodes I've picked up from a business scenario. This was 1924, uh, Jamshedpur, uh, Tata's. Dorabji and his wife Meher Bai, they received a telegram saying that, you know, there's a financial crisis. Uh, they don't even have the money in Tata Steel to pay the salaries, 1924. Usually you won't see promoters pledging their, you know, personal wealth in a scenario like that. Immense, again, emotional pressure. At one hand, you can lose employees. You're already losing the business. There's huge amount of social pressure also. In that scenario, Dorabji and his wife, Mehrbai, they pledged their personal wealth. They had a very famous diamond as part of their personal wealth called Jubilee Diamond. There's a very famous story around Jubilee Diamond. Both of them decided to even pledge their family's precious Jubilee Diamond and get the loan. In those days, 1924, they, got, they could secure the loan of 1 crore rupees, paid the salaries, made sure the operation ran, and six years down the line, the whole company was turned around. They were in profits, they secured everything they had pledged. They could do that because as leaders, they had immense emotional resilience to deal with such a tough scenario. So this was a episode two. Episode three now moved to a country, the country scenario. You might remember in 1990, when the Soviet uh, Russia, Soviet Union collapsed, there was a small company called Cuba and a lot of other companies in countries, including America, had put an embargo on Cuba. Those days, Cuba used to import all their oil requirement, all their food supplies. And with the Soviet Union's collapse, the Cuban oil supplies was shut. Their food imports were shut. Imagine the amount of emotional turmoil the leadership of Cuba was going through at that time. The whole population do not have food to eat. There is no petrol, there is no diesel, there is no fuel to run the machinery, to run the industry, to run even the mechanized farms. How will they produce the food now? Immense amount of emotional turmoil. So at that time, the Cuban leadership decided to go the traditional way. The whole country, by the guidance of the leadership, the whole country started going into organic manual farming. They removed the, the pharmaceutical or the industrialized pharmaceutical ways. They all moved to the natural healing ways. Everything about Cuba within that time frame of two to three years changed. Their health improved, their education level improved, their food habits improved because now they were doing everything with their own hands. And this started when the leadership took the call that even if we do not have the luxury to import food anymore or oil anymore, we will sustain as a country. They took that challenge. They showed the emotional resilience, which from the leadership then went to the entire population of the country and Cuba became a role model. There are beautiful films made on Cuba that how Cuba survived that period. Yeah shows the emotional resilience that when the leadership of the company has country has emotional resilience it can change the fate of a nation also three episodes i'm very tempted to share a very quick fourth episode also i think i should do that now this is the fourth episode about the culture of a of a nation or a, or a whole human civilization let's go now 5000 years back when the Yuddha of Mahabharata was happening, Krishna Arjuna on the battlefield, immense amount of emotional turmoil because Arjuna has to fight his relatives. He's shaking. He wants to run away. He wants to do everything possible to avoid that. He does not want to face the situation because of the emotional turmoil. At that time, Krishna comes back in the picture builds Arjuna as a leader with absolute heightened emotional resilience to deal with the situation, to do what is ought to be done and that became the culture of this land. 
again based on emotional resilience so these are four back to back episodes to share that the strength or the importance or the need or the enormity of emotion building emotional resilience at the leadership level having said that i think one thing again as, as to set the tone one statement one thing we need to all realize that if we can realize that one thing i think our ability to deal with people and situation will improve and that one thing is about human beings as human beings we are all imperfect everybody we are all unique and diverse we are all everybody we all have good days and bad days including the bosses and the subordinates and we all are work in progress we are all work in progress if we understand these four points then the ability to raise our emotional resilience will go many fold having said that in the current time when you know we are talking about new normal we are talking about the great resignation period right now there was a small you know news item about the great resignation now people are leaving jobs and all kinds of turmoils are happening we are all facing that in our personal lives and our professional lives i think it becomes extremely critical for all the leaders to develop this ability to lead through to be stable to develop that emotional stability to be able to wade through this this time and i would say not just the current times i think we've set on a journey where now the statement we always say that you know uh, change is the only constant is really becoming reality yeah before i invite the panelist just a quick bit on that let's look at what are emotions you know as human beings we all are emotional beings no exceptions we all are emotional beings and emotion impacts every part of our life personal lives our family relationships our work relationships our performance our productivity everything if you see is based on the emotions because at the core human beings are emotional beings we we need to realize this fact if we are emotional beings then we must also know how emotions impact us there have been tons of studies done now that how emotions affect our even physical well being you know even small things like i i meet lot of people on a daily basis uh, and people have you know chronic back pains chronic neck pains chronic uh, you know digestion issues chronic aches and pains lethargy all kinds of issues and we sometimes thinks it's lack of vitamins lack of postures well all of that is a factor but now there are cutting edge researches which are showing that emotion is the root of it if we are not emotionally stable then these ailments become part of our lives these ailments become lifestyle issues so emotional resilience or the lack of emotional resilience even impact our physical well being to a great extent so this is something which then needs to be really seriously looked at i'll i'll end this tone with with one realization that i have had you know emotion is a form of energy and the law of energy is you can either transform it or you can transmit it you cannot hold it yeah emotion is an energy so emotions if you do not transform your emotions from the sad negative emotions to higher positive exuberant emotions if we do not learn the ability to transform our emotions we will transmit our emotions and to whom we transmit the emotions to people who are close to us our family our our associates our work colleagues everybody who is in our circle we start to transmit our emotions to them now this defines the culture that we build as leaders yeah so with that let's uh, hear and learn from the esteemed panelist about the about some of the aspects about emotional resilience so i first invite shri ranjan ji ranjan ji the thought the question i thought i should ask from you is you know every business tries to make human life more enriching and comfortable i mean that's the whole premises of 
creating the business. Every business is trying to solve a certain problem to make life more better and comfortable. But in the process, I've seen that many businesses do not take into consideration the emotional well-being of their own people. What do you think about that? Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think uh, they have also realized when Anish speaks, everybody should remain muted completely. <laughs> So very, very well started, Anishji. I think the context to the way you have set it uh, is a superb. I think it will take this flow to the next level, I am sure. So uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, really, I mean, uh, I'm extremely happy to be here and uh, with uh, amidst all these uh, Shalini ma'am and Chandrasekhar ji and GP Garu and all others who are attending this today. So extremely happy to be here. So without uh, much ado, let me just come to this point which you spoke just now. Uh, I mean, I, I must say that this is a very fabulous observation. Um, to some extent, I'm also considering it a bit uh, dichotomic too. See, one side is economically speaking. If you are uh, talk, uh, talking about economics, so organizations need to operate on a strong top line or bottom line motive. Yes, there is no, uh, no doubt on that. At the same time, humans have always been considered one of the most important resources. So to me, it depends on the culture of the organization as to how they balance the both. So let me totally agree with you that uh, to a large extent, uh, companies have been more focused on physical profits and uh, thus ignoring the well-being of the people and uh, even many places where the organizations and the companies are concentrating on well-being, it is more on physical well-being uh, rather, than, rather than on emotional well-being. But uh, at the same breath, let me tell you the pandemic, you also uh, covered it, the pandemic has clearly shown the mirrors to the organizations. A new model is evolving. I think I, I very, I uh, mean, from, from my heart, from Ridesse, I call it as a human business model. So the, the companies, organizations have started including emotional well-being among the key agendas of the organizations. Now, going back to your observation as to why businesses did not take it into consideration, I can only blame it on the short-sightedness or non-balanced focus on monetary profit. So, because there, there, there seems to be a contrary and view as well that uh, if you have a sole focus on the well-being, it may not leave adequate bandwidth for the organizations to carry out the business. And hence, a vicious downward spiral may start. So what to do in this such, such situation? What do we really do? So, I mean, I, I, I don't, while I don't at all agree with this, I, I, say, I always say that we must focus on our core values. That is the fundamentals. And this should be juxtaposed uh, uh, with the vision of the company, with the mission of the company. So let me just uh, quickly uh, give uh, the example of Indian Oil. We, we have our uh, uh, set core values of care, innovation, passion, and trust. These drive our human resource. But at the same time, definitely as a company, we have a vision to uh, seek so that we are a globally admired company. So. Our business is driven by that reason, well supported by our core values. So all our actions are well anchored around our people well-being. And, and uh, to tell you very frankly, uh, Anishji, this does not stop our, at our employees only. I mean, we, it goes much beyond to our associate workforce. We have plenty of our workforces who are working in all uh, your retail outlets, which you see all delivery boys who go to your home to deliver your LPGs. They're all our associate workforce and our actions are well anchored around them as well. So just coming back, going beyond this, just to quote this latest report on the future of work from McKinsey, it mentions that business have an opportunity now to reimagine themselves and uh, look for innovative and equitable actions that can help people face the transition, which is happening. I mean, which has been more pronounced because of the pandemic. The report certainly asked the leaders to explore measures, including disruptive changes in their employment and in their business operating models. And of course, 
lot of consideration, whether it is diversity and inclusions, all those things are covered under that. So, I mean, just to conclude, I must say that there lies an opportunity for all of us and we must not let it go best. It's the time of awakening, you are told very, very rightly, it's the time of awakening and people must realize to that fact that this pandemic amongst all its bad things has given us the opportunity to come back and to really focus on this, on this and we must not let it go west. Thank you. Wow, excellent. Ranjanji, this coming from you, uh, you are at the hem of such, you know, large institution coming from you. This bhav, this sense is, is really reassuring, at least to me, I'm sure to all other participants also. Excellent, excellent. I now come to Dr. Shalini Lal. Um, uh, I'll call you Shalini, Dr. Shalini, if that's all right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shalini, I've often heard, you know, and I'm sure we've all often heard that, uh, at least I've heard it many times. People say, and this is even when I was, you know, initiating companies 15, 18 years ago, when I was on the entrepreneurial journey, people used to come and say that, look, Anish, business and emotions don't go well together. <laughs> uh, and I always objected to that in my own ways, because I thought business and emotions must go well together because we are all humans. But now the situations are really changed. Is it still valid in our new normal? Do you do you think business and emotions don't go well together? What, what's your thoughts on this? Thank you, Sri Anish. Thank you for that question. And uh, firstly, delighted to be here. I have such esteemed colleagues here. So thank you. So I think there is a place for logic and there is a place for emotion. And uh, honestly, true wisdom lies in being able to integrate the two. Uh, like, for instance, I mean, if I were to just take some of the stories you shared earlier, and you spoke about, say, the Mahabharat story, right? And um, there's an emotional response which Arjun has, given the circumstances and given the, you know, extraordinarily painful task of fighting your nearest and dearest. So there is an emotional response to a very normal emotional response to that situation. Yet in the Mahabharat, in Krishna's own discourse, it's a combination of both. It's about managing his own emotional state and it's about the logic of the situation. In fact, a lot of Gita can be considered almost a logical treatise in you yeah. know, how the universe works and therefore no. No. Maybe, uh, maybe reinterpreting almost the situation so that he effect. Um, so there is a bit of a noise. Uh, yeah, I, I will request all to mute themselves while the speakers are speaking. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, just taking your very example, you know, wisdom lies in both coming together. The emotional experience, which is a very normal, natural, and it would have, for instance, had Arjun at that battlefield not expressed his dismay and his. Uh, discomfort and had just sort of repressed it within and you know pretended that nothing was happening inside he would not have been as strong a warrior as if you know when he actually expressed it and was able to both understand work with the emotional state he was in and bring his intellect into it which is the entire Gita story it's a it's a story of you know understanding the universe so true wisdom does require both to come together. And uh, it means understanding your emotional state, not repressing it, not pretending it doesn't exist, but understanding it, knowing how to work with that emotional state, which is part of being human, the core essence of being human, and yet not giving into it entirely either. So being able to bring intellect where, you know, it has a useful role to play. So uh, wisdom is about being able to integrate both and knowing which is more relevant in what context. So uh, I think for organizations which are considering how to build you know, the future of work and how to deal with what we're going to see as exponential change over the next few decades, just being able to create an organization which has that resilience of being able to you know, deal with 
say the pandemic happened last year, but this is not the end of it. We're going to see so many future shocks over the next decade. That requires wisdom and that requires both understanding the emotional journey of change and transformation and having the intellect and reason to select the right direction. So I think they should go hand in hand if you want to create a wise organization. <laughs> so beautifully put, Shalini. So beautifully put. I'm, I'm glad, you know, you, you looked at Gita from a very multi-dimension and an integrational dimension. Excellently, excellently put. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini ji. Thank you. Um, I come to uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar now. Um, you know, you have a wonderful integration, Dr. Chandrasekhar, of both the practical implementational world of corporate. You've had a huge experience there. And now in the academia, you're at ISB now. So you best of both the worlds, if I may say so. So from your view, how do, how do you view emotional resilience, Dr. Chandrasekhar? And are we in corporate India, are we paying uh, enough attention to this very important uh, attribute of our well-being? What's your thoughts? Thank you for being, uh, the opportunity of being here. So, well, uh, my views are not very different from what uh, Shalini Ranjan and all of you are saying. Uh, what I have noticed is that uh, <clears throat> there are two parts. There is one is being emotional and the other is being resilient. And being resilient about emotions is emotional resilience. So, there, there are you know, many aspects to this. So I think we have been, I mean, it's nothing to do with the corporate India, the corporate India, corporate world is an extension of the social cultural system in which we live. So we cannot isolate the business and tell that you don't, you guys don't mix up emotions with business. I think in family lives, in social life, including in this meeting, we are hypocritical enough to handle our emotions. We will not let you know. If I feel one of you is fake, I will let you know. Never let you know that you are fake. Because I'm very trained to hide my emotions. And you have rewarded me for that. Socially and culturally, we have created an anti-emotional cultural ethos where we have selectively said that some emotions should not be expressed. Like if I feel like crying, then I should not cry. And some emotions can be expressed. And we have allocated different zones of life in which some emotions can be expressed and some cannot be. It so happens that the corporate world has been given the permission to express one of the four fundamental emotions. I believe there are four fundamental emotions. I call them popularly and many people call them sad, glad, mad, and scared. These are the four fundamental emotions that all of us have right now. We must be having some of them. We are either sad, disappointed, or we are glad, we are happy. We are mad, we are annoyed, angry, or we are scared, we are feared, fearful of something. Of these four, the emotion called mad, which is anger, annoyance, irritation, used for bossing over and showing one's power, is permitted in the corporate world. All other emotions are not permitted. If you are very happy, you should hide it so that somebody should not ask you for an increment. If you are very sad, you should hide it so that you look like a very heroic macho manager. If you are scared, you should hide it so that you don't look vulnerable. But if you are angry, and especially if you are in a powerful position, then you can abuse, you can scold, you can throw chairs, you can throw papers, and you will be legendary. Elon Musk, which is an admirable leader in the hands of millennials, is a legendary leader to have called a meeting at one o'clock in the night, just three days back, just to prove the point that you should work hard. And we celebrate, hypocritically, shamelessly, we celebrate leaders who boss over us, abuse us, show power, and show the emotion of madness. And we consider them as great leaders. And in our collective surrender to that emotion, we legitimized that emotion in the corporate world. But in our collective agreement that crying is bad, grief is wrong, vulnerability is wrong, being weak, being human is wrong, 
we have tried to create a false world. It is this which is really causing the tension that we are experiencing. So I want you all to appreciate this whole subject of emotion a little more granularly and in a nuanced way. And not to get a broad paint that there are no emotions in the corporate world. There are. But the emotions we have are not the ones which are most functional. The emotions we do not uh, exhibit or deal with are the more functional ones. So we should see how to bring them back. Unresolved grief has been the most important source of lack of productivity in whole of corporate world, which came into the forefront through a lot of academic research in the pandemic times. So it's time that we recognize grief, we recognize sadness, and we dealt with it. After learning to first recognize, in the next section, Anish Ji, if you let me, we'll talk about resilience. We are not even aware, we don't even notice, we don't stop by emotions. So what resilience will be built about it? Those are my thoughts. I think more than me, you set the tone, right? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. This is, I think, really, I can I can sense it, you know, some kind of a goosebumps. I can sense it that this is really a learning session for all of us. A very powerful, very, very important learning session. And sometimes I've felt that, you know, one session like this can really be life transforming if you're able to really grasp it open, openly. So thanks a lot, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for your, for your insights into this. Excellent. Excellent. I now... Come back to um, Ranjanji. You know, you you represent or or you have an experience with such a large institution, one of the largest, I would say. So while you know, I have in my earlier corporate days, you know, I've I've built some startups and I've looked at the culture of startups. And in startups, you know, dealing with these issues, I personally feel was much more easier because you're accessible to people. You can just call everybody to a room, talk about issues. And as uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar said, you know, we at times cried also, you know, in, a, in the board meeting, all of us together. <laughs> huh? So in a small company, you know, probably in a small setup, maybe that is more easier. I do not know. But Ranjanji, since you bring the perspective of a very large institution, what is your view? I mean, is there a large sector, small company thing in emotional resilience or building emotional resilience? Or is there a public sector or a, or a you know, non-public sector thing when one is talking about building emotional resilience in the leadership? What What is your thought on that, Ranjanji? Thank you, Ranjanji. And I, I let, would you allow me to be a bit blunt on this? Yes, please. Uh, I, can, I can say, I can say size doesn't matter. Rather, it is the mind of the leaders, culture of the organizations. I think that define, that would decide uh, how the company nurtures emotional resilience or it doesn't. I mean, I think I think whether it's a, it's a large uh, company or it's a public sector, it doesn't really make a difference. It doesn't, I mean, to me, it doesn't really make a, make a difference. See, today, uh, uh, Nishi, as we live in situations when you may be having multiple contacts, but... You are, you are very unclear um, uh, how you want to connect. Uh, uh, and that, that itself, I think, uh, Shalin Imam was talking about it. How does it uh, really come into a situation when you, have, you may have a state of loneliness and which could aggravate over the passage of time. And uh, at that same time, being connected with friends, uh, your family members or colleagues or neighbors is not a barrier against such situations. It should be. It should be nurtured. It should be. It should be there. Even a virtual contact. I mean, uh, I think many organizations had this. It was fine. I mean, probably there is a threshold point, and uh, when you cross that, this isolation backfires. So I believe leaders must maintain authentic communication with their teams, and that's more important. And that's possible. Whether it's a large organization, it's possible, and it doesn't stop there. It, it must, uh, I mean, these leaders must encourage their teams to do the same again. And it should have a multiplier effect. And the aim is what? The communication must reach the last mile. And, and in correct form too. Otherwise, we all have read about communication. When it goes through multifolds, it loses its essence or it loses its, uh, loses its form. But it must be ensured that it reaches the last mile and have 
still maintains its correct form. Leaders ought to walk the talk, whether it's in a pub public sector or whether it's in a large organization, they must keep inspiring the team to stay emotionally strong. I, I'll tell you from our experience, uh, we experienced during these COVID times, when the COVID stuck, um, uh, we had this, I mean, much before that, when we were aware that there might be some uh, lockdowns, there might be some issues, we set up uh, a, a COVID empowered group. This particular empowered group, of course, though virtually, met every day. I tell you, I mean, no Saturday, no Sunday, no holidays or anything during that period. It met continuously every day for nearly nine months. And uh, thereafter, of course, when uh, things eased up, uh, then it was made uh, thrice a week and slowly twice a week, but it met every day. Purpose, motto was what? That people in the last mile stay connected with the leaders. And probably, uh, Anishji, the technology also provide, provided us an opportunity to do, to do that. And that's what, that is what we have to take advantage of. So size, really, I mean, if you are a bigger organization, you have better infrastructure. That, that should be explored. That should be worked on. And uh, again, it, 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 uh, as I was telling, it all depends on the uh, lead leaders as to how they exploit it how they make it, uh, how they really work on it, how they create an environment, an enabling environment for people to be emotionally strong and resilient. And uh, of course, uh, we all agree here, sitting here and all these uh, participants who are there, it cannot come in a day or in a month. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be uh, over the time. I'll just, uh, if you allow me, I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, I mean, which I, I mean, they're very close to my heart, which well, it shows about the emotional resilience of um, my, my people. One, uh, you, we must have heard about this uh, flood which happened in Kashmir in 2016. I mean, Srinagar is, was totally flooded. Of course, as we all know, oil has to be supplied because if everything has to go on, LPG and uh, petroleum products has to be supplied. So my depot in Srinagar was operating. At that point of time, the location in charge, his, his father was seriously ill. So just imagine the emotional strain that person must be going through. At one end, professionally, he has to deliver at that point of time. He's expected to deliver. I think I love the way Chandrasekhar spoke about those uh, uh, ghettos which are, which are there. And, but he has to deliver at that point of time. Personally speaking, his father is not well, is, is extremely sick. So how does, how does he really, uh, I mean, take both the, both, uh, both the situations together and how does he really reflect that he is emotionally resilient? And he worked on, he continued its uh, work. It was supplies were made and unfortunately on the third day of this uh, flood, he lost his father. He could not come for it. He did not rather, I will I'll say he did not come. He could not come uh, for, for the, for the uh, ceremony, uh, but he knew, I mean, he knew he has to be emotionally strong and he has to display that to the team which was working under him. So this is one example, uh, which I can say. There is another small one, uh, very quickly. There's one uh, boy of ours who was working in a location called Dimapo in the Northeast uh, in Nagaland. He falls down, he, he hits uh, head down and, and he, he became extremely serious. Nagaland doesn't, Dimapur, Dimapur doesn't have any uh, facilities there. So as, as an organization is concerned, we made the, made the arrangement, we airlifted him from there, we brought him to Calcutta, got him treated, and the boy survived. It doesn't end there. I mean, a, a year back, just before pandemic, I think in the January, month of January 2020, I had visited Guwahati. The boy was in uh, in, in uh, wheelchair. He touches my hand. I, I, I went to meet him. He, he, he just helps, holds my hand and he tells me, sir, I will be back. And the boy is back. I mean, he is still working and he is doing. So these, these are the stories which really, I mean, it's, it cannot, I mean, this type of uh, resilience cannot be built in a day. It, it has to, must have, something must have gone in to build this amongst these people. So 
sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but because for becoming emotional while narrating this story, but this, this really touches the hearts of everybody. And these are the examples where we see that uh, uh, organization, whether it is large or small, can remain emotionally resilient. And if the fundamentals are very strong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful, Ranjanji. Two very beautiful points. One is that the large organization does have the infrastructure and the resources to reach out uh, in the emotional need. And two, your this personal example, you know, you as a leader, going to the last mile and meeting that boy is really actually a heart touching story of emotional resilience. So when the leadership displays that, you know, it really goes down to the bottom of the pyramid also. So I think really exemplary, uh, exemplary stories there. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjanji. Thank you. And Ranjanji also touched about um, in between a point of about, you know, the leader need to be authentic. So I'm just picking that authenticity point. Um, coming to you, Dr. Shalini, you know, we've often, and, and as Dr. Chandrasekhar were also saying about, we're not displaying the full range of our emotions somehow. There's something which I've personally observed called inauthentic emotions. Yeah, especially in the leadership. I've seen in my own personal experience, I'm saying I've seen some bosses will try to display emotional connect with the team. They'll just go and ask the team about, you know, how's your family doing and things like that. Without even hearing the response, they will immediately reach to the next question about the business. And I find there is an inauthentic emotional expression there. Yeah. You, you're not even listening to the full response of the person because the business agenda is there. So as leaders, how do we prevent that, Shalini? The inauthentic emotions, how do we prevent that? That's such a great question, you know, because you're right. I think sessions like the one we're doing, for instance, uh, perhaps their organization has taught them, you know, the famous whatever sandwich kind of method. You, know, you go in and, you know, you ask people, sort of get them comfortable. But that's not the point. The point is something else. So, you know, that's just a superficial kind of obligatory <laughs> opening statement. But, you know, so perhaps that's what they've taken. Uh, and um, so I'll say two things on that. You know, on the one hand, um, I'll give them and their organizations credit for at least attempting it because, you know, maybe maybe it's very uh, inauthentic and very incomplete, but okay, some effort was made. So some points for uh, at least making some kind of an attempt. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if you're on the other side, people can sense it quite quickly. I think as human beings, we're very good at sensing whether this is really there or this is, you know, okay, just had to say these three sentences and said it. And I think it leaves people even more confused than if it hadn't even been asked, because then you're not sure. And you might wonder, am I just imagining it that he wasn't interested or she wasn't interested? Or was this actually the case? You know, so if anything, it can create even more confusion in the mind of the person who's at the other end, you know, that uh, it, is my experience real? Is it in my head, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but one of the things I want to say, because of where we are at this time, you know, we've been in the pandemic now for a year and a half, almost, um, you know, whatever, a little more than a year and a half now. And um, over the last month and a half, uh, we've interviewed over 500 people who have, you know, um, for one of our client organizations to understand what is differentiating the managers with lower attrition rates than, you know, managers where, as you said, there's the great resignation and particularly in, you know, leading companies, leading tech companies, for instance, uh, this is a huge challenge. And um, in my own experience, I have almost been uh, surprised at the extent to which good people managers have gone. It's a level I have never ever seen in my 28 years of experience. So uh, for instance, uh, you know, just last week uh, we did a panel discussion of what were given to us as, you know, the great people managers in, in our organization to understand what are they doing? And people have spoken about things like uh, for the last 18 months, every Monday afternoon, I reserve an hour for speaking to new joiners, you know, 
And that's a huge chunk of time, right? Uh, on the other hand, in these 500-ish interviews at the other end of people who are very happy with their organization and, you know, we're hearing things like uh, their manager Friday blocks 20 minutes to talk to them in which work cannot come up. So it's almost like no work is allowed. So one-on-ones. Um, and other, you know, stories like, I joined and my managers told me, if you don't get support from the larger, and the, you know, these our clients are huge organizations. If you don't get support from the large infrastructure, no matter what, give me a call, I'll solve your problem within, you know, whatever hours. And I've heard stories about how managers have just gone out of their way for very basic stuff like, you know, laptop configuration, uh, <laughs> access to the system, very, very basic kind of stuff. But their people managers have really, you know, said, okay, give me an hour and I will turn this around. So I'm also seeing as many examples. There are so many managers who've maintained rosters, particularly those who are managers of, you know, teams of 300, 400, who've maintained rosters of who are the people who've been impacted by COVID, whose family members have been impacted, where have they needed support, call them up personally. So we've seen extraordinary examples, help in getting beds during the second wave, which I have never seen in this, like um, such a large mass of people go so out of their way. So you're absolutely right. There is that whole piece of, you know, uh, maybe I should ask because it's the right thing to do. But at the same time, in the last 18 months, we've seen more than ever before, a display of great, genuine, heartfelt leadership also of a whole other extraordinary order. So I think there's been a growth I feel there's been a growth for many, many people managers in their own leadership journey. Excellent. Wow. That's so, again, reassuring, Dr. Shalin, to hear that, you know, emotional resilience is really taking root in, in, in our world all around us. Uh, Sri Anish, yeah. GPF, yes, yes, GP, yes. I'm very glad that there are so many veterans sitting in the audience today. Dwarkana, Sudhakar, oh. Sridhar, Dr. Bhide. Raz, Rajan Sinha, Raghav Ayagaru, Suri, Dr. Suri, Vivek, Darang, Dr. Vivek, so many. And I'm also glad that we are getting great insight today. But I'm sad that we have limited time. <laughs> I'm very mad that I can stop you also. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we need to be a little more mindful about time. Yes, 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 GP. Um, quickly, uh, coming to Dr. Chandrasekhar, um, you know, I, I quickly want to understand or, or get your insights about emotional seclusion. There's something called emotional seclusion. And I've personally met some bosses or people, you know, who come across as tough boss image. Uh, they're not impacted by the emotions and they're above all the emotions kind of a thing. But in that process, you know, the teams feel almost alienated. They just can't reach out or connect uh, with that leader. What, what's your view uh, on this, Dr. Chandrasekhar? That's true. That's true. But I think uh, there is a strange disconnect about this whole thing of feeling connect. And that's what I, I find very uh, deeply disturbing. <clears throat> so suppose there was a boss who displayed his full range of emotions and showed the feelings very naturally became very authentic, was not secluded, then the very subordinates, and the word itself is very interesting, it's drawn from the language of slavery, uh, the very subordinates who on the one hand want his connect, also on the other hand behind his back tell him that he's an incomplete. He doesn't have strength. He's not a heroic boss. So I'm constantly bringing to our attention our own ambivalence about what we really need in others. Do not, our bosses, we deserve our bosses. Bosses are us. We become the bosses. And in us, there is this strange third year to first year behavior, which I always describe that most engineering colleges, still governments became a little stronger, had this phenomenon called ragging. And uh, people who were ragged most in the first year, I would have expected them to be gentle in the third year, but they were the biggest raggers in the third year. 
Okay? This phenomenon I can never understand. Human beings' complete resolute unwillingness to learn from one's own experience is a strange form of ignorance that I cannot understand. We suffer in the hands of emotionally excluded bosses. We recognize that we wanted them to be more authentic. But when we become a boss, we continue to be like him or her. What is causing this collective failure to give emotions its legitimate place is a much bigger issue than one panel discussion can analyze. It's a cultural issue. Humanity's choices about the cultures they have created to decide what is right and wrong have not paid adequate attention to the repertoire of emotions. And so we need a, we need an uh, analysis at a higher level. It will certainly sound academic. I will not have tips and tricks, tricks in this because they are all fake. This whole boss saying that I will um, say hi to you, I will do a one hour meeting every week. How much of it is corporate dictated ritual and how much of it is to look shining in the face of people and how much of it is a genuine emotional response to the individuals that the person deals with is very difficult to make out. Because we have collectively committed the sins of not showing emotions, we have also created HR functions especially are great at creating strange rituals which force people to show emotions. And in that inauthenticity, we perpetuate the syndrome of the inauthenticity that you talked about. So how do we take organizations beyond rituals? How do we ingrain the culture of being human with each other? That are the bigger questions. Not that I have the answer, but I would like us not to get carried away by some gestures as equal to being truly authentic. Excellent. I, I excellent. hope you understand what I Yes, saying. excellent. Uh, something on this, Dr. Chandrasekhar. I'm very tempted, though I have not planned this, um, this to ask from you, but listening to you for the very first time on this subject, I'm very tempted to ask you, uh, and not to offend you, but genuinely want to understand. Uh, you're, you're speaking very passionately about this, and which I'm really loving, and I'm sure all the panelists and all the participants are also really loving that. I've rarely seen people who are still part of the management in the corporate, let's say HR, HR, or let's say any any functional, talking so convincingly about the wrongs that we have set as corporate cultures. Yeah, I've I've rarely seen that. What I really want to know is, are you able to speak about this so passionately and openly because now you're in the academia? Or were you also so passionate and speaking so aggressively about it when you were part of the corporate world? Sorry for, for, for asking such question, you know. The answer is I was not speaking about it like this in the corporate world because I was afraid of my job. And I wanted to take money. I wanted to give my life and my family a good income and a good lifestyle and I couldn't be sacked. So I suffered. I hated what I was going through, but I went through. I'm speaking so openly here because you can't uh, sack me. And, uh, <laughs> he was scared. Ranjit <laughs> was scared, the fourth one. <laughs> so I have, I'm not at all being dishonest here. I mean, I absolutely yeah. true that I was not like this. But though in the very passion for corporate world, there were several insulations possible. So what was possible is there was a small territory in which I had autonomy. There was a small area where I had influence. In many parts, in some places, they were bigger. In some places, they were smaller. In those places where I had the freedom, I certainly was as passionate and people probably experienced me that way. But wherever more powerful people who threatened me uh, existed, there I surrendered. I was playing the game of survival. Uh, that, yeah. that is the I, I must say, Dr. Chandrasekhar, you've made many fans today in the in the participants. I, I can feel that amongst all of us also, by the way, no uh, kind of this, this so. truth, this honesty. But the reason I raise this point is because while we are still in the in this side of the job, I think we need to be vocal about some cultural changes that are really needed, not just for our benefit, but for creating the sustainable, holistic yeah. cultures lest, in the world. Lest I be understood as a cynic who believes that the whole corporate world is gone for 
moral <laughs> fiber which probably it has um let me give you the example of one person whom we all know is now setting this this kind of leadership very authentically and yet achieving great business success uh and he is satya nadella so watch what he is doing at microsoft talk to the people that are dealing with him and he is not in the league of uh, jeff bezos and uh, steve jobs uh he is more in the the league of jamshed ji tata and uh, all that so we do have in the corporate world some people who having reached the positions of power show the level 7 leadership that we talk about do stay humble and emotionally authentic and do connect to people not as rituals but as genuineness and sometimes i'm also little sad and to know that this comes when they have personal traumas so in some of these leaders they have had some personal traumas which has taught them about the uh, the value of life the value of respecting others emotions so the conclusion is that yes if you have the opportunity you must uh, display not this passion about advocating but the integrity that in your actions you live a life of authenticity and i would appeal that all of us have those moments when we can do it and we should just keep enhancing it and if you're looking for examples there will be always a few yes. satya nadella is one of them excellent thank you thank you dr chandrashekar i'm so glad uh, i know gp we we are uh, running um, bit late but so okay so I'll, we'll have to you know uh, compress compress the whole thing a little bit uh, short answer so so i would uh do one more round of allow gp to do one more round of uh, questions from the panelists i'll probably club a few things in this round and request the panelists to be precise and two minutes each yeah two minute wisdom each we are the instagram um, population these days <laughs> okay uh, coming to uh, dr shalini two quick things in the emotional resilience a is there a gender angle uh women versus men it's kind of an angle because uh, many of us feel that women are more resilient some feel women are more emotional so a that two quick inputs on the tools to build emotional resilience yeah please dr shalini uh, well um, i think it's culturally more acceptable for women to be more in touch with their emotions and to i mean starting from being more cognizant of emotions of everybody around you so even in the family structure like you know you're rewarded as a good daughter if you are conscious of okay what does mama want what does papa want so it starts right there that you know girls are taught to be more careful about understanding the emotions of everyone around and so i do think that uh, girls are and women eventually are sometimes um, better more conversant in the vocabulary at least of emotions and knowing where they are in it uh does this make them more emotionally resilient now i don't know the research on it my own sense is that i think women have a lot of emotional resilience in general that's i mean this is being anecdotal i very rarely say stuff without research backed evidence but this is one thing i'm just saying based on my own experience that um i i do fi- find that women who have lived a little in particular you know say my age if you like uh you know uh, do develop a sort of uh, you know emotional resilience over a period of time whether or not they started out with it you know maybe in their teens or it's harder to say but i think the whole act of in a sense creating uh particularly if you happen to you know raise a family then the whole experience of you know understanding the ups and downs which are very natural of life and providing or uh, that kind of support which you know people need and that's by the way a very gendered role but it is a role which a lot of women have played mm-hmm. i know i have also played mm-hmm. i think it does create a certain sense over a period of time at least of um, you know having um, shall i say resilience wisdom whatever <laughs> through, this, through this process your second thing of how do we develop it now that's a it's a difficult one because there's no one thing there is a basket of things that can help develop i think having personal philosophies is very helpful whether that personal philosophy is coming from you know a spiritual place or whether it's coming from a secular place it doesn't really matter but a a personal philosophy that allows you to take things in stride 
in some way that's really helpful uh, i think having practices is quite helpful and again those practices could be spiritual practices they could be secular practices right from you know whatever yoga meditation to something like running hiking trekking it doesn't really matter but you know some place which centers you is truly helpful uh, knowing what works for you because in the end we all have to develop our own personal emotional life resilience plan and what works for me may not be what works for you you may have something else which is even better but you know that whole personal mm-hmm. discovery of how do i get into the best head space for me it takes a little bit of trial and error before you discover that um and lastly i think in general a optimistic outlook in life does help because it helps you you know there are going to be lows and you know you spoke about uh, this a little earlier and i was reminded of you know rumi saying i think uh, chandrashekhar ji spoke about how uh, you know people who are wounded uh, may not be empathetic but on the other hand like you know rumi is saying that the wound is where the light enters you and you spoke about how satyanadel or some people who've gone through tragedy have that so it, it, it tragedy can go either way it can make you bitter it can make you better and you know you have to sort of choose for yourself which way you want to go it could be either way so i think those are some of the basket of you know practices tools philosophy yeah. which might help <laughs> excellent thank you thank you dr shalini thank you very much uh, coming back to you dr chandrashekhar uh, i know it might not be um, justified but you know two minutes wisdom on how to develop emotional resilience uh, in instagram <laughs> thank you thank you um, <clears throat> not wisdom just the experience that i've had i think first of all everybody is interested it's important to distinguish between emotional awareness and emotional resilience the two words should not be loosely and interchangeably used emotional awareness itself is a huge leap for a lot of us i if i challenge many of you if i just ask you what is your current emotion many of you may not be able to even name it that's the truth so we are not even in touch with our emotions we have been always running away from them so first step is to be more deeply aware of your emotions which needs reflection which needs to give yourself the permission i like the word shalini used which is philosophies of life which is there is no way you can do these big changes unless you have something that you believe first of all do i care about emotions only in a uh, panel discussion or is it something that i'll go back now and again continue to think about is a big issue so you got to have people who are for allowing themselves to rise above the mundane and the tragedy of life have the opportunity to first discover emotions resilience is the ability to uh, bounce back resilience means that if you have had a very sad emotion then you won't stay with that for too long and you will come back to equanimity sooner than others that is what a resilient individual is so mohammad ali says if i am a boxer you hit me every boxer falls but i am those bo- one of those boxers who takes the least time to come back mm. resilience is about the least time to come back to normal state from a disturbed state so to to develop awareness there are tricks which is about self reflection ability to go back into yourself and spend some time with you and watch more carefully and have this i must say that in spite of all the gendered role we have created uh, uh the opportunity that uh, society has given to women and they have availed of it about being more emotionally genuine is a great blessing they have i wish from that angle i missed being a woman because i missed the opportunity to experience my emotions which i have been denied to be experienced so we must learn from our spouses and our partners in life and be more emotionally aware that is the first step once that happens imagine just practice about take one or two emotions which are bothering you and some of them are one of the most common ones which we don't recognize are actually jealousy one of the worst emotions that we all suffer from without our own knowing 
we watch everybody around and you know suppose somebody is speaking better than me i feel jealous about him for hours after this panel discussion that um, if i can bounce back and come back to more practically by just recognizing it yeah. so these are two three things that i am trying in my life it's a big effort it's not easy but uh, there are no tricks it's it yeah. is more beyond tricks it's commitment yeah, yeah. great so beautiful so i'm feeling very jealous dr chandrashekar <laughs> just confront joking. it confront it <laughs> just just joking just joking very beautifully put dr chandrashekar once again thank you thank you thank you very much the i loved the part of you know uh, friends this is a very beautiful definition of resilience the ability to come back to your balanced or normal state after feeling the lows of a certain emotion that is what resilience and that is what is the target we are trying to achieve as our own leadership evolution uh, so to say beautiful thank you coming to you um, ranjan ji uh, two minutes insight wisdom experience on how do we develop emotional resilience what's your thoughts in fact i think each one of us sitting here are looking for it i think <laughs> it's it's everybody is looking for it and now chandrashekar has already set the ball rolling by saying that we are faking emotions all the time so we don't really don't know <laughs> what are we looking for <laughs> so let me uh, i i really it's it's uh, let me let me also quote from uh, geeta i don't know my my hindi is uh, uh, my sanskrit is not that good but let me let me try to say that Uh, I read uh, two things about Stita Pragya. Mm-hmm. This is uh, Stita Pragya se ka bhasa samadhi stas se kaise ho? Arjun is asking again. Gita is, I mean, I think Anish ji has told, Shalini Mayam has told, everybody speaks about Gita, so I am trying to quote from there. Stita di kim pravashe kim asit brajat kim. I mean, in fact, he is trying to ask, okay, kaise ho? What is the disposition? of one who is situated in divine consciousness and how does an enlightened person talk how does he say it? i mean he uh, i mean i can put it as how does an emotionally resilient person behave how does he work how does he say all these things and very beautifully of course uh, uh, bhagwan uh, responds he says prajahati yada kaman sarva parth manogatan आत्मनिवात्मनाटेडरी i'll just take a few uh, words from chandrashekar and try to say i love the way he told about one thing yes we have been, we may have been faking it but at the same time let us identify let us know what is in my control where i can do it he gave that example that within the area where it was under his control he did it and that's what i also keep on telling my people don't worry about uncontrollable things if you are See in our life, uh, Chandrasekhar ji, in our life, ninety-five percent of the things are under our control, and only five percent is uncontrollable. The road is bad. This is bad. That is wrong. The weather is bad. It is snowing today. All these are uncontrollable, and we do worry almost seventy-five percent of the time about the uncontrollable. Those five percent uncontrollable, we forget about that. I can control ninety-five percent of the things which is under my control. So with that. i have very simple solutions anish ji if you all agree that i will try to give it uh, to you one is that we must educate ourselves i think that is something which is very very necessary for all of us whether through therapy whether through reading whether through attending such type of uh, seminars where uh, people are talking of all diverse uh, things we can always know more about how humans cope i think i think that's very 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 important for each one of us i think uh, had i mean just me just in a zest uh, tell that had these people had our uh, uh, attendees today not attended this one they would not have really viewed this uh, they i mean they would, they would not have got the views which anushekar set forward yes this comes this brings a realization amongst each one of us number 2 
build your own support system i think i think that's very important surround yourself with loving with empathetic people with positive people i think that's that's and you must have an optimistic approach to life we can't we all of us can't wait for a tragedy to turn us down i mean turn us around i think i think we all must look towards optimistic approach to life and again the the, the last, third thing is that please practice mindfulness avoid distraction the whole world is full of lot of noises i think noises really disturb us noises are important you pick up words from there but you learn to sit with your feeling without reacting i think that that is another thing and the last thing which i i told i started with practice differentiating between what is in your control and what is not we have all heard about uh, mr tn session i think i read his uh, the book uh, if you are read he says that he was always worried that as a as a collector he did, could not do a few things and he just held it back till he became the uh, election commissioner and implemented those things he felt it should have been implemented then he could not have done it as a as a district head at that, that point of time but when he got a chance he did it so all of us who are in a position to make those differences i feel very strongly we should try to do that uh, mm-hmm. again i mean how how we do it really would depend on each one of us and how do we do it everybody will have a different way of doing it but we must try to do that mm-hmm. last but not the least anish ji pandemic has given us a chance i think probably uh, what uh, salini ji was telling me what chandrashekhar was also hinting at in, in, in between that it has given us a chance to realize it has given us a chance to introspect ourselves and realize that yes we are creating this ghetto around us we are creating the silos around us we got to get out of it so that's my mm-hmm. take thank excellent. you excellent excellent ranjan excellent you know you you spoke about noises and one of the things we we tell uh, in some of the gatherings to a people is that there's something called signal to noise ratio if you can tune yourself to that and of course there's a whole methodology how do you tune that so that you're able to get the signals and you know delete the noise all around so yeah i think we need to have a retreat in order to you know train all of us how to do that <laughs> okay i come back to you gp for your uh, inputs because this is 12 18 already please uh, guide us on the uh, time no 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 i yeah. think uh, there's lots of education has happened and we need to be optimistic so one optimism is i want to check with the audience don't hide your emotions if you are happy and glad and you you are okay if you extend the session by 10 15 minutes just put a uh, thumb you reaction button uh, i am asking this to the audience okay so yeah so then accordingly we'll do that yeah many people are saying yeah yeah that's it so please don't hide your emotion you are you are not happy no no it's a sunday morning no can't so you also tell me like this you know, where many people are glad that they are a part of this discussion and lot of great insights are coming so let's take a few questions from the audience i think swati should help us yes uh, yeah Okay, yeah, I have the questions. So, yeah, on the question, take the shorter ones. Yes, that's what I'm <laughs> going to do. <laughs> so, friends, we might not be able to take all your questions because of the paucity of time. I'm, you know, we these are some of really insightful, lovely questions which can open the whole new chapter uh, to allow us to go deeper. But because of the paucity of time, we'll just pick a few. Uh, and and uh, Anish, uh, Anish, I want to clarify to everybody: each question will be answered. we will send out the answers to you personally that's our commitment promise assurance okay yes yeah <clears throat> gp in the spirit of what we are doing yeah let me tell you that you ask the audience if you can extend you should have perhaps asked us also if we can extend as far as i'm concerned after 10 minutes of 12 yeah, 30 yeah, yeah, it is 12 yeah. 40 Yeah, I I may be permitted yeah. to leave. I have so thank you for uh, letting your emotions know. <laughs> yeah, you are free to leave at twelve thirty. Yeah, twelve yeah, right. forty. He said twelve forty. Twelve forty. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I was negotiating. I said twelve forty. That's wonderful. I'm just. No, no, I, I wanted to be. So no, 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 you can leave at twelve thirty. I'm negotiating. No problem. Yeah. You can leave at twelve yeah. thirty. Also, <laughs> thank right. you. Thank no, you. thank you so thank much. You. I missed that. Right. Yeah, yeah. I said Sri Anish, but I included yes. you. Yeah, in that. Yes. So the first question we take is of uh, Sri Mukesh Das, 
and he asked how to convert negative emotional energy to positive emotional energy hmm. um i'm not sure who should answer that um if you permit can i can i answer that yeah and you all the panelist if you have something to add please uh, feel free so how to convert negative emotions to positive emotion very important and that is what the tools that we've been discussing or talking about i'll give you mukesh ji seven steps seven steps to do that or or let's say seven tools to do that seven quick tools to do that first whenever there is a negative emotion that you are sensing come back to your breath you know, normally if you see our breath is shallow up to here come back to your breath the moment you bring your awareness to the breath it goes deeper yeah so that's the first tool have deep breaths immediately number 2 when you are looking at the deep breath you bring yourself to the present moment you know because emotion has taken your thoughts your mind to somewhere else you come back here to the present moment third learn to respond rather than react you know reaction is very immediate i'll give you a very 30 second story there was a great uh, mystic called gurjiev in armenia russia his father was dying gurjiev was a great mystic his father was dying and he asked his father sir give me one teaching so that i can better my life huh? a mystic is asking his father the father says son whenever somebody says something which upsets you just have one commitment to say i will respond after 24 hours not before that huh? so which means you respond you learn to respond rather than react that's a third tool huh? if somebody disturbs you just remember this to respond back not immediately hmm? take some time think over it meditate over it and then only respond back fourth i would say as um, dr shalini said in between move your body uh often now we become a generation we not too physically active when you move the body you basically start to nurture all your hormones and all your glands and if your glands are nurtured they are working fine so your hormones are uh, you know flowing absolutely perfectly in your body and they are also very responsible in your emotional resilience so that's a fourth thing fifth let us practice to forgive let us practice to first forgive our own self and then let us practice to forgive the others yeah small practice forgive your own self and then learn to practice forgiveness of the others it takes a load big burden off your shoulders sixth there is a hindi word called seva do acts of selfless service to people who are known to you or people who are not known to you when you do that your emotional resilience meter starts to go up yeah the acts of seva and last seventh let us learn to be kind to ourselves uh, we are sometimes way too hard on ourselves uh, and we kind of hurt ourselves way too much because we're not kind so take out time be kind to yourself invest your time and energy into things that you love apart from your professional and personal commitments yeah you should have some personal personal commitment to your own self also so nurture those aspects about about yourself yeah hope hope uh, that makes sense uh, anybody from the panelist want to add something to it i'll just quickly add this one practice which personally i found helpful just in case anyone else wants to try it's one by jack confield um, and he speaks about how do you like you spoke about you know you either transmit or you transform emotion so how do you transform and his practice is that when you're feeling a negative emotion you feel it you truly feel it become aware of the sensations that it's creating in your body and when you ask yourself who would you be without this what would it be like if you didn't have this and you experience that as well and then there's a series of steps around you know practicing letting it go consciously practicing the dark cloud sort of receiving so there's a whole practice around that personally whenever i've needed to do this you know and <laughs> they've been several times mm-hmm. i found that a pretty helpful like 10 minute practice to sort of switch gears from feeling a lot of negative emotions mm-hmm. to feeling much lighter mm-hmm. with a few minutes excellent 
Excellent. Great. Uh, shall we move on? Yeah, let's uh, take another question. Yes. There's a question from uh, Shri Sanjay Parashar and he asks, which is more harmful, personal integrity or organizational integrity? How to control it through emotional resilience? Uh, Ranjanji, would you go for that? I think I think I would I would leave it to Chandrasekhar to answer this because sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he has spoken about it very beautifully. Yes. I think that would be his words will be more important. I can add on later on. I think Chandra sure. Yeah, I think Dr. Chandrasekhar, yeah, please. Thank, thank you so much. That shows your integrity. <laughs> um, so my first advice would be: don't make a distinction like that. Organizations are collections and reflections of persons. You cannot have a non-integrity persons and organizational integrity or the other way around. So there is no distinction between the two. Integrity is integrity. It has to start at the level of the person first to be able to collectively manifest as organizational. So once the dichotomy is not there, the question is superfluous. I, think, I, think, I, think, I, I just want to add on to that same, same uh, feeling. Yes. Both of, both of them are equally important. Both of them cannot be separated from each one. I mean, it, it is, both are very intermingled. And uh, as, as, as Bun Bun Banke Sagar Banta, it was similarly on the same, I mean, personal integrities add up to your organizational integrity. So individually, it has to be maintained so that at, the, at an organizational level, we also maintaining integrity. To the, and integrity is not just small part, uh, Sanjay. It's, it's much beyond what we are exactly thinking of. I think, Chandrasekhar, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll take two more questions, GP. If, if, yeah. Uh, uh, so this is a question from uh, Shri Yashwant Chauhanji. And he says, Given the powerful impact of emotional resilience in enabling overall positive outcomes, what can organizations do to redefine the definition of talent in the emerging future of work? Yeah, true. So what can organizations do to redefine the definition of talent itself in the emerging future of future of work? Um, so I'll go to Dr. Shalini. Yeah? So organizations are already doing about it. Yeah. Question is whether they are doing it in a um, sincere way is the question. So by the way, in the last few years, the a whole competence or whatever you call it, called emotional intelligence, has entered the lexicon of uh, corporations. So all HR departments have uh, revised, revised their competency directories, if you like, and they ask the senior leaders to be emotionally intelligent. And uh, in that, they are implying that the senior leaders will be more self-aware and self-regulated and develop empathy and uh, show all those qualities which uh, the uh, thinker called Daniel Goldman has proposed about emotional intelligence. And uh, this is now a very popular movement. Companies are already cognizant of this need. But the problem is there is so much in the environment that is against it that it becomes an isolated exercise uh, in the, you know, just to show off to the shareholders that we are also doing all the right things. Uh, but it probably change begins like that. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that there is a greater recognition of emotional intelligence in companies. And that would define talent of the future. Talented leaders of the future would be known for their emotional intelligence. And once we start recognizing, defining, educating, rewarding, promoting, advocating, evangelizing uh, the whole idea of emotional intelligence, I think a significant movement will happen. Hmm, excellent. Excellent, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, quickly, 30 seconds, Dr. Shalini, would you like to add something on this? Yeah, I think it's uh, central to the future of work leadership, frankly. Uh, emotional resilience at two levels. One, personally, because as leaders, you're going to be facing far more crisis than ever before. And therefore, if you don't have your own whatever strategy, skills, it's a practice more than anything else. You know, your own system, if you like, of being centered in, in your best headspace, you're not going to be able to manage personally. So there's that piece. There's also the other piece that the future of work requires organizations to be much more adaptive and innovative than ever in the past. So what we are going to see is that 
building organizations that have capacities for innovation and adaptation requires a different style of leadership. It, it, the authoritarian hierarchical style will not create that organization. So I think uh, what I will, where I'll differ a little bit from Chandra Shekhar Ji is that we, we are going to see that change. We're going to see that change because there is no choice. Companies which are not able to create, uh, you know, innovative or adaptable, agile uh, systems within them will fall by the wayside. So it may not be that one organization may or may not be able to make that transformation, but over a period of time, say 10 years later, when we're having this call, we'll see a much, many more organizations with both that style of leadership and, you know, the organizational capacity. So that change is coming. There is no way around it. It is coming. Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. I, I think, uh, Dr. Shani, these sessions that, you know, uh, GP and Sadho, we both started together are in that direction to creating the, uh, we, we are calling it awakened leadership uh, for the future of work. Yeah. So great point. Thank you. Uh, last question, which is uh, for Ranjanji, uh, is by uh, Shri Raghunandanji. And he says, how do we identify the fake emotions who do not want to take up challenges during turmoil and influence them and be a resilient managers. I'll repeat. How do we identify the fake emotions who do not want to take up challenges during turmoil and influence them and make them into resilient managers? Number one, number, I mean, absolutely brilliant questions. If as a leader, I succeed in that, then I can always pride myself to be a great leader. <laughs> So let me tell, tell very frankly that, but it's important. How do we really identify? Every leader must have his own system of identification. I think it could be different. I think how uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar will uh, identify, how Dr. Salini will identify, or how Anishji will identify, or I, how I will identify will be different. We identify, normally we try to identify uh, from the manifestations at those situations. So manifestations give us an indication that what exactly is going through the person. I mean, I think that's that's extremely important. So now that's number one. Number two is that how do then I convert them? I, I told it in the very beginning, every leader has to create an enabling environment. Again, if we are talking of fake emotions, we cannot, I cannot create a fake enabling environment. It's just for the uh, I mean, heck of it, I'm creating it. Okay, I can meet every every one of you every week. You can tell your problems. And uh, like Anish, you told in the beginning that and within a minute, I immediately switch on to the business questions. And I don't hear even whatever has been told. No, not that. The leader has to create that enabling environment to the twist sense. And then obviously the resilience, I mean, emotional resilience for say, can be can be built in. Um, um, I think I think I told uh, very clearly Ragnanji that in the beginning that it cannot be just a, in a day or in a month even. It has to it has to be nurtured by the leadership after leadership. The leadership also changes. I mean, uh, we don't have uh, continuous that. Okay, uh, in, in, a, in some of the organizations, you may have a leader which will continue forever, but most of the organizations still have change of leadership. But it should be so inbuilt in those leadership, it should be so systematized that it creates, it, it, it provides that to all of your people. And obviously, then it can be, it can very easy. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Ranjanji. Thank you. I think we won't be able to take any more questions. GP, allow me three minutes to be quickly sum up and give a yes give a flavor of emotion how to build resilience how to build emotional resilience yeah so one of the things which we didn't get the time to talk about um, in the session today is the root of emotions where do emotions emerge from come from yeah there was a there was a great uh, Chinese mystic called Lao Tzu he made a very beautiful statement which, which shows that we are the source of emotions. He says, watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions because they become the habits. Watch your habits because that is what becomes your character. And lastly, watch your character because that becomes your destiny. So he 
he starts from the thoughts and to me that is the genesis the started po- starting point of an emotion you'll be surprised every day in a single day as humans and there are contrary researches to this as humans we get between 6000 to 60000 thoughts a day that's the number of thoughts when we give energy to these thoughts they start to become charged up emotions so it all begins from a thought from a small thought which becomes a charged emotion yeah and i have personally felt last uh, 15 years since i've been on the path of a sadhana that how do you how do you build emotional resilience so we'll do a 2 minutes short meditative exercise yeah to see how to build this i request you all to kindly close your eyes just for 2 minutes sit totally comfortably absolutely relaxed we're not talking about any concept around emotions now any insights about emotions now we just entering into the sensing mode now take three long breaths and the long breath is that when you inhale your belly comes out three long breaths feel your body feel the pressure in your body if you are sitting pressure on your back pressure on your neck just come inside your body feel the body's posture connect with your own self no movement absolutely still keep your eyes closed i'll repeat three statements inwardly just repeat these statements with me inwardly while your eyes are absolutely closed while your body is absolutely relaxed while your breath is absolutely even first statement in this beautiful life i am mindful of all my thoughts and emotions now repeat inwardly in this beautiful life i am mindful of all my thoughts and emotions i'll repeat once more in this beautiful life i am mindful of all my thoughts and emotions take a deep breath we move to the second statement eyes closed absolutely relaxed body breath even second statement in this joyful life i have the ability to transform all my thoughts and emotions now repeat inwardly in this joyful life i have the ability to transform all my thoughts and emotions in this joyful life i have the ability to transform all my thoughts and emotions take a deep breath again completely relaxed third statement in this blessed life every transformed emotion 
helps me become a better person now repeat inwardly in this blessed life every transformed emotion helps me become a better person will repeat in this blessed life every transformed emotion help me become a better person take a deep breath again one more deep breath and with a smile open your eyes but with a smile wah thank you thank you thank you gp over to you wonderful and <coughs> our friends uh, so we have a few pleasant things to do one is to thank each one of you so i'll start with thanking dr chandrasekhar because i already delayed him by 2 minutes so chandra and all we have known to each other for last 42 years so so i love him love his uh, wisdom love his personality love his knowledge thank you chandra for speaking thank you gp thank, thank, thank you i'm thank sorry you. i have been no 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 i understand, I understand but it's great to meet all of you and you. Uh, anish ji i i thank uh, dr shalini lal so so thank nice you. i mean you brought a difference to the session that's it and of course ranjan ji you know i knew him as a line manager successful line manager now a great hr professional and then the future the business leader uh, a great person and finally of course sri anish for not only setting the contest sharing his nuggets and moderating session but audience are always important because you are the real uh, beneficiaries real contributor to the session so you all stayed here we touched the three digit mark i think we touched around 110 80 people are still there each one of you deserve thanks of course the sadho team so how what we do now is we'll try to conclude uh, one is each one of you can conclude by writing what is one thing that touched your heart each of you can write in the chat box and the panelists and uh, sri anish also can say one word something that touched you today uh, listening to others or got an idea uh, and to me i'll start you know i thought uh, emotional resilience today i got this idea emotion is all about heart is about soul resilience is all about action so i i got that idea you know because in combination of you no know, the thought action uh, so that's what i maybe the passion and business so some 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 idea occurred to me during the session thank you so i would request all of you to write down uh, thing and i promise you each of your questions will be answered so we'll uh, we, that's what we have been doing i will request the panelists and sri anish to answer your questions thank you so much uh, thank you so much and we'll keep the zoom session on because there are some uh, uh, people friends well wishers in the audience may like to uh, interact with each other so we'll keep the zoom on for some more time thank you so much thank you thank you thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you anish ji thank you chandrasekhar ji and salini ma'am thank you very much dr gp rao thank, well, <laughs> thank you very much thank you it has been a for me it has been with us i mean so so i have it really thank really you, thank, thank you, you very much thanks a thank lot you. salini ji your parting words no i so much wisdom actually uh, and with very different flavors very different flavors i just love the way it came together ranjan ji shri anish chandrasekhar ji very different perspectives but um, i love the way it came together thank you so much for thank you ranish your you. seventh nugget seven you got <laughs> <laughs> eight one <laughs> yeah yeah i think the eighth nugget is the constant uh, deeper inner bhav of gratitude for everything that life shows us um I think that will build the amount of emotional resilience we can't even imagine. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. No, lots of ideas. So the takeaways which we were not mindful of, the audience has picked up. So that's the power of collective wisdom. 
collective excellence. That's why I said it's a journey togetherness. So thank you so much.